right, we're going to go ahead and get started. If you would open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. The traditional Christian view is that the Old Testament is not for us today, that it was the law. That when Jesus came and that was and his earthly ministry shown in Matthew through John, that he brought something new. He abolished the law. He brought the new covenant because we're in the New Testament now. And he taught that to, uh, so basically we need to follow that now. And then the book of Acts, people see as after Jesus' earthly ministry, he ascended back up to the Father, and now he's in heaven. And so then the church begins uh, with the Holy Ghost coming in Acts chapter 2. That's the traditional view. But what we've seen as we rightly divide the word of truth is that's simply not the case. Way back in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham, God started the nation of Israel with Abraham. He built that middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile so that the Jews were his favored nation. They had favored nation status. And uh, he gave his law covenant to Israel when we get to the book of Exodus after they're brought out of the land of Egypt. And then when Jesus comes then, that's just a continuation. The status of the nation of Israel at that time, according to Luke chapter 4, is that Satan had... Is, Israel was just part of the kingdoms of the world that Satan possessed. Isaiah chapter 49 verse 25 says that Israel was Satan's lawful captive according to the law because they had broken the law, they received the curses of the law. Five cycles of chastisement, Leviticus 26. Jesus came to redeem the nation of Israel from the curse of sin from violating the law so that they are no longer Satan's lawful captive. Matthew chapter 12, he said he came to bind the strong man, which is Satan, and then to spoil his house, which would be uh, Israel. So that he came to save Israel, and he came as a continuation of, the, of Israel's program. So the law covenant did not go away. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. And so now that we're in the book of Acts, it's just... Jesus' earthly ministry was a continuation of Israel's program. We saw it was just the time cycle as far as Daniel, the book of Daniel is concerned, the 70 weeks of Daniel, was that once the Messiah was to be cut off, then you'd have the seven-year tribulation period. The Messiah would come back, uh, redeem, saved Israel, and then they would be enter into God's eternal kingdom on earth. That program has not changed. Jesus came, he died for, he gave his life a ransom for many, the many of Israel. Matthew chapter 15, verse 26, he came, said, I have come, but unto, I've only come to the law sheep of the house of Israel. And so now that we're in the book of Acts, Jesus has ascended to the Father, but he said, when I ascend to the Father, and we read this in John, that John chapter 14, 15, and 16, he said, when I ascend to the Father, then I will send the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. He will guide you into all the truth, the truth that I've revealed to you, and he will show you of things to come, that tribulation period that's coming, and then the subsequent kingdom of God. And so when, the, when we see here in Acts chapter 1 now, it's just a continuation of that program. Israel's program continues. We do not have the church starting in Acts chapter 2 but rather it's just a continuation of Israel's program. And that's what we're going to see. So in chapter 1, uh, basically we have Jesus instructing his disciples about the kingdom of God. He ascends to heaven, and then he chooses Matthias from heaven to complete the twelve apostles. So if we start there in verse 1, Acts chapter 1, verse 1, The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. This tells you that Luke wrote the book of Acts, that's how he start, He addressed the book of Luke to Theophilus, and he addresses the book of Acts to Theophilus as well. It's a continuation of the book of Luke. And, in fact, interesting, a little trivia, is that Luke writes more scripture as far as verses and words are concerned uh, in the New Testament than any other writer, even though he only writes two books. Uh, they're fairly lengthy books. Uh, which means it's going to take us a while to get through Acts, but there's a lot of good uh, benefit from the book of Acts. And so verse 2, it says, uh, well, verse 1, he says, he made the former treaties, that's Luke, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up. And so then that's where Acts starts. It's right just, just before he's taken up, just before he ascends to the Father. 
uh, then continuing in verse 2, it says, After that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, uh, meaning his death and resurrection, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So he's telling them about the kingdom of God so that they will continue to endure until the end of the tribulation period, get through there and not uh, yield to the Antichrist, but continue to preach the gospel of the kingdom to the lost sheep of the house of Israel throughout the tribulation period. Uh, he gave them proofs, which would be uh, things like the infallible proofs, of course, would be the all the scripture that he fulfilled. Most importantly, it's not just the casting out of devils or healing the sick, although he did that too to show that, the, that those were proofs that the kingdom of heaven was at hand because those are things that will happen in the kingdom as well. But, um, well, I should say the casting out of devils, and it's, it's a cleansing for the kingdom, I should say, because there aren't going to be any devils in, in God's kingdom. Uh, but those were proofs of the kingdom, the casting out of devils and healing of the sick. Then the other, but as far as his proofs... Uh, the infallible proofs that Luke is talking about in Acts chapter 1 verse 3 would be all those Old Testament scriptures that he fulfilled as the Messiah. And uh, he went over when we were in Luke chapter 24, that last chapter where he meets the two men on the road to Emmaus. Uh, he says he showed from scripture, just going through from beginning to end, showing them uh, how he fulfilled the passages as Messiah. So that's what he does with the apostles here. And he's seen of them for 40 days. So that's after his resurrection. He is on the earth for 40 days. Uh, verse 4, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. So they're, they're going to stay in, uh, they're going to stay in Jerusalem because that's the religious center of Israel. And Israel's program is continuing through the little flock. So they are going to reach the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So they are to stay in Jerusalem waiting for the promise of the Father, which would be the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, or which he talked about in, uh, in the book of John when we cover that. So in verse 5 it says, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Uh, they actually are baptized with the Holy Ghost, as chapter 2, verse 1 says, it was on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost is uh, Penta, 5, and it means really 50 days from the time of the Passover. So they had the Passover. That's when Jesus was crucified on Passover day. He was within 40 days. And so the Holy Ghost would be coming on the day of Pentecost, which would be 10 days after. So we know when he says, not many days hence, that means there are 10 days left because 50 days minus the 40 Jesus is with him leaves 10. And the reason that he comes on Pentecost is very significant. If you hold your place and go to Exodus chapter 34, uh, the word Pentecost, I believe, is only found in Acts. It's not in the Old Testament. However, there is a feast associated with that day. And it is called, in your Old Testament, it's called the Feast of Weeks. And we see over in Exodus chapter 34, uh, verse 30, uh, sorry, 22, Exodus 34, 22, says, And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Thrice in the year shall all your men children appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. So they're supposed to, uh, that really that verse talks about the three feasts there, um, the Feast of Weeks, the first fruits of wheat harvest. Um, and so really, what the, the Feast of Weeks is a celebration of the harvest and, and the first fruits of the harvest. And that's important because spiritually, in the, so the reason the Holy Ghost comes on the day of Pentecost is because spiritually speaking, the harvest begins. That's the first fruit of the harvest right there, the little flock the 120 people that are gathered on the day of Pentecost in the upper room, they are the first fruits, and meaning that the harvest is beginning. Spiritually speaking, Israel, who had previously been Satan's lawful captive, the strong man has been bound, they're no longer his captive, and they are freed and able to enter into the kingdom 
if they believe the gospel, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And this all starts with the giving of the Holy Ghost here. And so that's why it's on the day of Pentecost. It's really a celebration of the, the first fruits there of harvest. And if we go back to John chapter 4, you can see spiritually speaking how Jesus referred to this previously to his disciples. And in John chapter 4, verse 34, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white, all ready to harvest. And of course he's talking spiritually, because he just told you in verse 34, that his meat, you think physically, food, well his meat, his food, is to do the will of the Father. And so then the harvest which is food, you're harvesting, but it's not physical food, it's spiritual food. And so he's saying basically the fruits of the harvest, the first fruits of the harvest are there. The, white, the fields are white already, meaning it's time to go out, preach the gospel to the lost sheep of the house of Israel because they're ready to be harvested or, or taken up out of Satan's kingdom and been placed into God's kingdom. And so that's, it's not a coincidence that the Holy Ghost comes on the day of Pentecost. It's specifically showing this is the beginning of the spiritual harvest of those lost sheep of Israel and how they're going to be become saved and they're building up that little flock more and more into a nation of Israel, the nation, the foolish nation that's going to be saved as opposed to the Jewish religious leaders and enter into the kingdom. So now we get to verse 6, Acts chapter 1 verse 6. Uh, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now, there's a lot in this question. First off, if you remember in our studies in the book of John, the disciples were brought up in, Jew in the Jewish religious system, and as such, the Jewish religious leaders taught them that the Messiah would come and he would set up his kingdom right away. He would overthrow the Roman rulers, and uh, the Israel would have be ruling, God would be ruling uh, with them, and they would rule over the entire world. They did not anticipate, they did not see from Scripture, they did not want to see, because they didn't have the ears to hear or the eyes to see, that the Messiah would first come and suffer as a ransom for their sins, Isaiah 52, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, Psalm 69, etc. But they saw him as the coming king, so that when Jesus was arrested and he gave over willingly, you see Peter denying the Lord. You see the apostles running in fears from the Jews. They're locked up in a, in a room, afraid they're going to be killed next. And then you see, as we saw last week in John chapter 21, Simon Peter, he goes back. Jesus had said in the book of Luke, he says, if you put your hands to the plow and look back, you're not worthy to enter the kingdom of God. Well, Simon Peter looked back. He says, I'm going to go fishing. He gave up on the idea of preaching the gospel of the kingdom to, to Israel. He had given up. But then these 40 days in between have really changed the disciples because Jesus has instructed them in the kingdom, shown them the mysteries of the kingdom. He showed them the, of how he gave them the infallible proofs, how he is the Messiah. He showed them of how he fulfilled those Old Testament prophecies. And so now they are, they are gung-ho again, ready to bring in the kingdom. But you can see that they would naturally be a little apprehensive because at first they thought... When they first signed up for this program of preaching the gospel of the kingdom, they thought Jesus was going to set up the kingdom right then and there. And he didn't. He went to die first. So now they're gung-ho about going out there and being fishers of men and reaching the lost sheep of Israel. But they're saying, well, now, is, are you going to do it this time? You didn't do it before when we expected you to restore the kingdom to Israel. So are you going to do it now? So that's a legitimate question that they ask him. Wilt thou at this time? restore again the kingdom of Israel because God had given them the kingdom at first. That was his covenant promise, brought them to the land and they headed uh, under David and Solomon. They were thriving pretty well, but then because of their disobedience of the law of covenant, they fell under the curse of sin and they were taken into captivity. The times of the Gentiles began as Daniel chapter 2 talks about and so they no longer had the kingdom. So he's asking, so they ask him, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Jesus says there in verse 7, And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. 
what we find out is what's really going on. If you hold your place, let's go over to Luke chapter 13, and let's also get Daniel chapter 9, so we can see, chronologically speaking, where we are in Israel's program. So Luke chapter 13 and Daniel chapter 9. And let's look at Daniel chapter 9 first. Uh, starting in verse 24, it talks about the 70 weeks for Israel. Those weeks are weeks of years. 70 times 7, of course, is 490 years. And we see that in Daniel 9 verse 24. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. So that's obviously Israel. The holy city Jerusalem, thy people, the nation of Israel, those who he called out, set apart to be his own, Genesis 12. And then we see uh, in verse 25, it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerus Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks, and three score and two weeks. So it'll be seven weeks before they begin to rebuild the temple, because at this time they're in Babylonian captivity. And then there's going to be another three score and two weeks, or 62 weeks, before uh, Messiah. So 7 plus 62 is 69. So that's 69 of the 70 weeks. And you see there in verse 26, it says, And after three score and two weeks, so after the 69 weeks, the 7 plus the 62, shall Messiah be cut off. So that's where he is being crucified. So Jesus, in, in the book of Acts here, he's already been crucified. So the 69 weeks are already finished. There remains only one week for Israel's history before the kingdom comes. That's one week. It's a week a year, so it's seven years left. And we see at verse, in tw verse 27, it says, referring to the Antichrist, it says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. A lot of fancy words there, which basically tell you that the, after the Messiah is cut off, after he is crucified, then, the, then there is a seven-year tribulation period left. That's under the Antichrist. And then once that tribulation period is over, then the kingdom will come in. But it doesn't start until he confirms the covenant with them. So the Antichrist has to come on the scene and confirm the covenant. Well, the status of the nation of Israel, you can let go of Daniel 9 and look over in Luke 13. You can see what had happened when the Lord Jesus Christ came the first time. He came to see where Israel's spiritual condition, and they were in apostasy. They did, they did not have saved people there. I mean, there was a little flock, but the nation as a whole had rejected God's law covenant, living in apostasy, living under their religious traditions. And so God gave a one-year grace period. Luke 13, verse 6, it says, He spake also this parable, A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. So that would be God had this religion that he set up, the, uh, the law covenant there for the Jews. Uh, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree. That's the three years of Jesus' earthly ministry. And find none, cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it, and if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. So in prophecy, you see, once Messiah is crucified, then the, the tribulation period begins, and then God's kingdom comes. But because the nation of Israel was not ready for the kingdom, they were in apostasy, they give, they're given a one-year grace period here to get with their program, to become that kingdom of priests, to reach the Gentiles, to believe the gospel of the kingdom. And so that's what we see here in Acts chapter 1, verse 7. It's, I'm sorry, Acts chapters 1 through 7, the first seven chapters of the book of Acts. This is not the start of the church. This is not a new covenant. Things are just because the word New Testament appears before the book of Matthew doesn't mean the new covenant has actually started. In fact, the new covenant is prophesied of back in Jeremiah, back in the Old Testament. Uh, it's not going to come until Jesus comes back and brings them into the kingdom. And that's when they'll live under that covenant. But for now, the old covenant, the old law system that God started all the way back with Abraham, that covenant he made with Israel to set them apart, and then he started the law back at uh, Exodus chapter 19, and following there, that is still in effect here. 
and it's going to be in effect at least for one more year, which is Acts chapters 1 through 7. And if Israel continues in apostasy, well, then that's then that they will be set aside, and then a new period will start, which is what actually happens, and that's why we're in the dispensation of grace today. But the gospel of the kingdom is still going out in Acts chapter 1. Now, in Acts chapter 1, verse 7, Jesus, of course, knows what's going to happen as God. He knows the future. He knows that the result of that one-year grace period is that Israel is going to continue in apostasy, and they're going to be set aside, and the dispensation of grace will start with the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9. But he doesn't tell them that, probably because they'll be discouraged. I mean, would you want to go out and preach the gospel of the kingdom to the lost sheep of Israel at the risk of your very lives being persecuted and possibly killed by the Jewish religious leaders if you knew that the result would be that the kingdom's going to be set aside anyway. Um, that would be a very big demotivator uh, not to follow the program. And so that's probably why uh, Jesus doesn't tell them what's going to He doesn't say, well, you know, Israel, yeah, you're going to go out, you're going to risk your lives, but eh, Israel's not going to believe. Um, of course, Jesus wants them to go out because they still need to have that offer given to them. He told them back in Matthew chapter 12, they committed the blasphemy of the Son of Man. And he says, you got one more chance. You've already blasphemed God the Father. You've rejected his law. You've blasphemed God the Son. You've rejected the gospel I've given here. And, and the works I'm doing, the kingdom offer. Now you've only, there's only one more member of the Godhead. That's the Holy Ghost. And if you reject him, your program's over. You, you've rejected God. There's no fourth member of the Godhead to go to. Uh, and so he has to, but they still, even though he knows the future, he still is going to give them that chance. And that's what the first seven chapters of Acts is. It's a chance for the nation of Israel, their last chance, to believe the gospel of the kingdom under the power of the Holy Ghost. And so that's what we see in verse 8. Jesus doesn't tell them in verse 7 what's going to happen in the future, but he does say in verse 8, But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. That power there, it's not really referring to speaking in tongues, but rather it's a couple of things. Uh, let's, If you hold your place, go over to John chapter 15, and we're also going to look at John chapter 20. The power of the Holy Ghost, the speaking in tongues, is just something that's more today. It's in the flesh, and we'll get to that in, uh, when we get to Acts chapter 2. But... In John chapter 15 and verse 7, Jesus says, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. The idea there is they're going to go out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 talks about the Jews require a sign. And so they're going to need to see miracles to believe that gospel that the that the, the little flock is proclaiming. And so they need the spiritual discernment to ask of the Father what miracle is needed in order to, so the lost sheep may believe. And that's, that's why it says, ask what you will in my name, I will provide it. So if they have that spiritual discernment to ask the right miracle so that that person believes, then they will, as verse 8 says, ye bear much fruit. <laughs> Meaning, souls are saved. The lost sheep of Israel... Uh, become found. So the first part of the power of the Holy Ghost is the spiritual discernment to know what to ask of the Father, what miracles to do, so that the lost sheep may be found. And then the second part, John chapter 20, is that when someone does say that they believe the gospel, it's the power from the Holy Ghost to determine if they really do. I as a man, if I go out and preach the gospel, someone could tell me that they believe it, and maybe they're just doing it because they want me to be their friend, or they want me to give them money. I, I have no idea why they say what they do. I don't know what's in the heart of man. God knows what's in the heart of man. And when they have the power of the Holy Ghost in them, then they can discern what is in that heart of man. So when that person says, I repent, I'm abandoning the traditions of the fathers, I'm going back to God's law covenant, I'm going to follow that, I'm going to preach the gospel of the kingdom to the other law sheep, just like you tell, told me, I'm going to be water baptized, they can discern if that person is being sincere in their confession 
and then they and because of that then they will forgive that person's sins if they don't see if they're not sincere the the holy ghost will tell them and they will not forgive their sins look in john chapter 20 verse 22 and when he had said this he breathed on them and saith unto them receive ye the holy ghost whosoever sins ye remit they are remitted unto them and whosoever sins ye retain they are retained so that's the twofold power that they receive i mean speaking in tongues there's power in that certainly but a far greater power than speaking a language you don't understand is the power to forgive sins and it's the power to do miracles uh you know through god doing miracles through you that will bring someone to to be saved so that's the twofold thing that, of the power there notice this commission also going back to acts chapter 1 verse 8 so that's the power after the holy ghost has come upon you you should be witnesses unto me and then it says where they're going the first three jerusalem judea and samaria those are all territories within israel jerusalem being the religious center and then they're going to spread out judea being the uh the southern part of the nation of israel jerusalem was in that and then samaria would be the northern ten tribes uh, of israel so they're going out to those areas and then finally after that unto the uttermost part of the earth so they're not this is not a call to go to the gentiles the, they have to go to israel first and if you go over to Matthew um, chapter 10, Jesus says in verse 6, Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he commissions them to go to Israel. And he says then in Matthew 10 verse 23, But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, Ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. And so they're not going to finish. Jesus says in Acts 1 verse 8, you go to Jerusalem, then you go to Judea, then you go to Samaria, and then you go to the Gentiles. But Matthew 10 verse 23 says, you're not going to finish those first three parts there going to Israel before Jesus' second coming, before the end of the tribulation period. So by putting those two verses together, we can see that Jesus has told them by putting those together, that they will not go to the Gentiles before Jesus' second coming. They will only go to the Jews because they have to be built up as that kingdom of priests before they can, as a whole, go out to the, to the nations, to the Gentiles. Notice also in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that there are really two, although there are four things mentioned, there are really only two territories. You've got Jew, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. So there are four there. But notice the word before that, and all your modern translations take this out. Only your King James Bible tells you this. It says, You shall be witnesses unto me both. The word both refers to two things. If I say I am going to go both to the store and to the movie theater, that would be correct. But I wouldn't say I'm going both to the store, the movie theater, and work those are three things both can only be used for two things and so even though you see four things mentioned here really there are only two groups here the first group is Israel that's Jerusalem Judea and Samaria and then the second group is the Gentiles and so he's really breaking it out and the reason he breaks it out like that is because of what we saw in Matthew 10 verse 23 they'll go to the Jews then Jesus comes back at the end of the tribulation period, establishes the kingdom. Then they will go to the Gentiles. So there's, so you see the distinction. The middle wall of partition is still up at this point. There is that distinction between Jew and Gentile. Uh, verse 9 now, when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Uh, so they've already, he's now, this is his ascension to heaven. Uh, verse 10, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, Two men stood by them in white apparel. Uh, so those, these would be angels. Verse 11, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Uh, the reason they're saying this, uh, you know, they're still looking up. Maybe he's still in sight. Maybe they can still see him. I, I don't know. Uh, but the point is, the angels immediately you say, say, stop looking up. Basically, you got a job to do. First fruits of the harvest, Pentecost is coming. The, white, the field is already white with harvest, uh, to be harvested. You've only got seven years, and you won't even get to all of Israel. 
Then you got all the Gentiles to go to and the thousand year millennial reign. I mean, you got a lot of work ahead of you. And you can't just dilly dally looking up, depending on Jesus, as far as looking to him physically, like you've been doing for the last three and a half years. Not doing anything unless Jesus goes with you or tells you to do something. Rather, you're going to have to go out, you're going to have to preach the gospel of the kingdom for the next seven years, and you'll do so not with Jesus guiding you, but with the Holy Ghost guiding you, uh, with you being filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, so it's really trying to get their focus off of the physical presence of Jesus, which has left them. They won't see him again. As they said, you'll see him in like manner coming down. They'll see him at the end of the tribulation period. And between those two comings, they've got a job to do, reach the lost sheep of Israel. So stop looking up, get to work. That's the idea here. Verse 12, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. So they obeyed where Jesus had said back in verse uh, where was it? Verse 4, it told them not to depart from Jerusalem until the promise of the Father has come. So that's what they did. They go to Jerusalem and they wait there for that promise. Um, verse 13, and when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both. There's your word both again, but you're going to have 11 apostles mentioned. Uh, that's to distinguish him because Peter, Jesus had established him in Matthew chapter 16 as the leader of of the of the apostles there of the little flock and so the both really is referring to peter being the leader and then all the others uh it's interesting you don't really have that until you get to here because jesus it would have been before you'd see maybe both jesus and his disciples and his 12 disciples because jesus was the leader the disciples were the followers now peter is the god-ordained leader of the little flock and so they say both peter and the 11 it's just like saying you know both uh, for example, you think of in the United States, the president. You we would say both the president and his cabinet went to this event. Those two groups of people, the president and all his followers, that's what you have here, Peter, and then all the other members of the little flock. All 11 here are mentioned, and it's really to show you that what Jesus had said back in John chapter 17 and verse 12, when he prayed to the Father, he says, All that you have given to me, None of them are lost. I have kept them safe in you. And we saw that they all fled. Matthew chapter 27 talks about that. They all fled when Jesus was arrested. And they went to, they went away. Jesus had to restore them. He had to go back. He restored Simon Peter. And then he in turn would feed his flock, feed the sheep, feed the lambs. And so it shows you that even though none of them were lost at Jesus' death, after his resurrection, he's restored them. None of them are lost right now. All 11 are still there. He hasn't lost any of them. And also, you see down in verse 14, it says, These all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So that was, we went over that last time about how, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, from the cross, Jesus had looked down, saw Mary, and said to John, Behold your mother. And from that day on, Mary went back to John's house. And I mentioned how that was to make sure that she would not be lost. So we see no one has been lost. Jesus has kept them. Even after the resurrection, all 11 apostles are there. Except, of course, Judas Iscariot is lost. Um, son of perdition. And then you see the women. You see Mary, the mother of Jesus. And then you also see with his brethren... That's interesting because now we see that Jesus' brothers are saved. Not too long before this, they were in unbelief. If you hold your place and go over to John chapter 7. In John chapter 7, it's time for a feast. And so Jesus is going up to Jerusalem and his brethren there, uh, verse 2, John 7 verse 2. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence. And go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. They're sort of mocking him. Uh, For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. They don't believe him. Verse 5, For neither did his brethren believe in him. They did not believe in him, even his own. Well, they would technically be his half-brothers. Um, as the Holy Ghost was the father, of or God the Father was the father of Jesus. <laughs> Uh, not Joseph, but they didn't believe in him. But now, after he died on a cross and he rose from the dead, and they spent those 40 days, now you see that his brethren 
are part of the little flock. Uh, so not only did some of not only did Jesus not lose any of those that were given to him, but you also see some were added as a result of Jesus' death and resurrection. Verse 15 tells us there are 120 there. It says, In those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120. So you got 120 people there. Now, uh, verse 16, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus, for he was numbered with us and had attained part of this ministry. So he's talking about a scripture and needs to be fulfilled. Verse 16, notice the uh, inspiration of God's word and the fact that it says the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spoke this. And so God's word isn't just something that man wrote down, but it was... Uh, the Holy Ghost, or God himself, gave those words. Um, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21 says, Holy men uh, spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so it's the Holy Ghost, it's God's every single letter and word of the Scripture is God's word. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, not just the red letters. Not just, you know, what Jesus said, not, not just the New Testament, not the good part, not just the blessings, but not, it's everything. All scripture, every word, every letter is inspired by God. And it was just basically, the result was that the Holy Ghost said, here's what you write down. And then the men, the holy men, they wrote down exactly what the Holy Ghost told them to write down. And so that's why... He says there, the Holy Ghost, by the mouth of David, spake this. And the scripture, if you jump down to verse 20, it says, For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. This is the scripture that Peter uses to support replacing Judas. But the fact is, is these are two scriptures. Um, if you hold your place and we'll go over to those there in the book of Psalms, uh, Psalm 69, verse 25, and Psalm 109, verse 8. Because I want you to see these two. Psalm 69, verse 25 says, Let their habitation be desolate, and let none dwell in their tents. So that's the, let, their, let his habitation be desolate, that Peter quotes. That's Psalm 69, verse 25. Then over in Psalm 109, verse 8, Psalm 109, verse 8 says, Let his days be few, and let another take his office. So when Peter says, The Holy Ghost spake this by the mouth of David, he says what he spoke was, Psalm 69, 25, Let his habitation be desolate, and lo, no man dwell therein. And then, Psalm 109, verse 8, His bishopric let another take. Now this is very interesting. Can you see the complete transformation in Peter? The best rabbinic scholars, the best scholars who really study their Bible, you know, the, the, the real you know, ones who have memorized the, the Bible and do the scripture like the back of their hand, there's no way they would have figured out, let's take Psalm 69 verse 25, piece it together with Psalm 109 verse 8, and that tells you that Judas Iscariot must be replaced. You, you, you couldn't figure that out. It's not, you know, it seems like it's completely taken out of context. And it would be. I mean, I would accuse somebody of doing just that, except for the fact that it's the Holy Ghost who inspired this, and he wrote it down. So if the Holy Ghost said that's what he did, he's the one that authored it, then that's, that's the meaning of those verses. And that's exactly, Peter is not taking them out of context. But what's interesting is, he is putting together two pieces of scripture to come up with a reason for uh, replacing Judas Iscariot that no, nobody on earth could have ever figured out. But yet the real simple things, Peter had no clue about what Jesus had told him. Uh, he didn't think back, in, and won't have time to go over this, but uh, he did not think that Jesus would die. Matthew 16, verses 21 through 22. He, he didn't believe Jesus there, that he would die. Uh, then, when, then in Luke 18, we're told that in verses 33 through 34, we're told Peter didn't believe he would rise from the dead. Uh, then in John 20, verses 6 through 9, we see that Peter did not believe in Jesus' resurrection, even though it had already happened. And 
Then, even still after Jesus had already appeared to them him twice after his resurrection, John 21 verse 3, he was going fishing. He had given up on following God's commands. So you can see here that you know Peter was pretty I mean, he was just like all the other disciples and you can't blame him. Uh, he just didn't have the the spiritual understanding, but yet Jesus had opened their eyes once he had resurrected from the dead and he showed them the scriptures such that not only did they believe that he died, he rose from the dead, they know the scripture well enough to know that this is a scriptural justification for replacing Judas Iscariot, getting that 12th apostle in. So it shows that the Peter that we saw in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John is not the Peter that we're seeing in Acts, even before the Holy Ghost comes upon him. He is a guy who knows the scripture very well. And the reason is because of what we saw in Acts 1, verse 3. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, over there in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus had told them in Matthew 29, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew 19, <laughs> there's no 29, Matthew 19, verse 28, Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's the kingdom. So when Jesus spoke pertaining to the kingdom of God, he undoubtedly told them. He says, look, I told you before I died that you guys are going to sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. There's a problem, though. Now there are only eleven guys. There are twelve thrones and eleven guys. We need to rectify that problem. So we need a twelfth guy. So that was part of the kingdom. So that's how Peter knew. It's not that Peter just thought, ah, I'll, just, I'll see what I can put together. So I can, we we got to elect somebody, and uh, you know I want to make it an even 12, so let's elect somebody. So I'll just piece together. I'll just take that scripture and this other scripture, like people do all the time to justify their doctrinal, false doctrinal positions today. Uh, but he doesn't. It's the Holy Ghost who spoke it. It's the, it's the Lord Jesus Christ who showed them, showed him, you need to get that 12th person. And he fulfills, he's fulfilling scripture, he's fulfilling what the Holy Ghost said in those two Psalms by replacing Judas. So that's what he's going to do. Going back though to verse 17, Acts 1 verse 17, I did want to make a comment here. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 18, when you see Judas Iscariot, it says regarding him, regarding Judas Iscariot, it says Acts 1 verse 18. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the mist, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue As 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 Asaldama, that is to say, the field of blood. So I wanted to bring this up because we need to look at uh, Matthew 27, verse 5. Compare this to Matthew 27, verse 5. Some people will say, well, this is a contradiction in your Bible. Matthew 27, verse 5 says, uh, referring to Judas Iscariot, he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. So Matthew says Judas went and hanged himself. Acts says that he fell headlong, he burst asunder in the mist, and all his bowels gushed out. People say that's a contradiction. Well, really, what it means is that both are true. Jesus had said it would be better that the man, whoever betrays the Son of Man, it would be better that he was never even born than for him to betray him. We've already seen Satan entered Judas Iscariot in order for him to go and agree with the chief priest that he would betray Jesus. Then he entered him again when he actually went and betrayed him. So it's, it's not, I think it's very proper to say, given that Satan has already entered Judas Iscariot twice, and that Jesus said it's best that this man was never even born if he betrays the Son of Man, I think it's reasonable to conclude that at the time when uh, Judas threw the, the pieces of the silver into the temple there, that he, Satan entered him a third time. We're not told that, but Satan entered him. He went and he hanged himself, and Satan had complete control of his body, and so he wasn't just content with killing him, but he wanted to, you know, have all the blood and gore and everything. And that's what we see there described in Acts chapter 1. So that's the explanation of the two. 
But it's also important to note it because it shows how evil Satan is. Because normally you think, well, you think of some evil person, and usually they'll have some their right hand men, so to speak, who they treat well because they serve their they serve their purpose. But yet everybody else, you know, they're evil. They 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 treat them evilly. It's just their right hand men that they treat well, and that's how they you know prosper because they give them good position and that's what the antichrist will do with apostate israel giving them a good positions in the tribulation period in the antichrist kingdom but it shows where satan satan is so evil that even the man who has served him well the best servant he's had and that he betrayed jesus christ and got him killed satan just being evil as he, he just utterly discards him and he just uh just does all this blood and gore stuff to him uh, so it shows you know, how evil Satan is that even the one who serves him the best, he still treats uh, as badly as he possibly can. Uh, so that's what happened there. Verse 20, we went over that, uh, they, that they're going to replace Judas now. And so uh, notice in verse 21 now, now what they're going to do from here through the rest of the chapter is they're going to choose this 12th apostle. And... Most Christians believe that this was a mistake, that they were doing it under the flesh, that they were uh, they just they they weren't doing God's will here, and so then God had to pick his twelfth apostle, that would be Paul in Acts chapter nine, so that Matthias really doesn't count as a twelfth apostle, but that Paul is at the twelfth, and that really comes from a lack of rightly dividing the word of truth. We're not in the dispensation of grace here in Acts chapter 1. We're in Israel's kingdom program. In Israel's kingdom program, the 12 apostles were needed to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. And Paul was called later on to be for the dispensation of grace. If you hold your place and go over to Romans chapter 11, we'll see that he is not one of the 12 apostles to judge Israel. He's not a, well, he is a Jew, but he's not chosen in a Jewish position to be over the Jews. Rather, Romans 11, verse 13, he says, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. So Paul's calling was different. It was not to be one of the twelve apostles to judge Israel. This is a completely different program. Paul was called to be an apostle of the Gentiles, but not an apostle, the apostle which shows there were 12 apostles under the Jewish kingdom program. There's only one under the, I mean, there are others as far as Ephesians chapter 4 is concerned, but as far as uh, the orderly fashion, as far as being over that dispensation, there's only one, the apostle of the Gentiles, the apostle Paul. And so it could not be Paul. But we can see also from Acts chapter 1 that the qualifications... Uh, Paul doesn't meet the qualifications to be the twelfth apostle. Uh, also, we know that Peter is not in the flesh because he is doing, as I said, no rabbinical scholar could figure out piecing those two verses together, but rather it's the Lord Jesus Christ. He told them the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. The Holy Ghost then had spoken these things in Psalms. And so Peter is acting on the command of the Lord Jesus Christ through the revelation of the Holy Ghost in the Psalms to to replace Judas Iscariot with the 12th person. And the criteria that God establishes is, of course, Jesus would have told them this as well, because this is important. If you're going to have 12 people ruling over all of Israel, which is going to rule over the Gentiles, you got to make sure you pick the right person. So Jesus Christ was careful to tell me he needs to be replaced, and he also tells them what the qualifications are. Acts chapter 1, verse 21 Wherefore, of these men which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So the qualification is this 12th apostle had to be just like the other 11. They had to follow the Lord Jesus Christ from John's baptism, from the time that John preached before even Jesus began his earthly ministry. They had to be followed, they had to believe the gospel of the kingdom that John the Baptist preached and then follow Jesus throughout his entire ministry. Not just when they gave when he gave him food or drink, but throughout the entire ministry. Uh, and so verse 23 says they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. So it was probably 
the only two remaining that met that criteria, probably. And so those are the two that they appoint. And then verse 24 says, And they prayed and said, They're not in the flesh here. They're praying to God. And they're, do, they're doing this in direct. Jesus had commanded them to do this under the authorization of the Holy Ghost, speaking through the mouth of David in the book of Psalms. And now they are praying. They prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whither of these two thou hast chosen. Because they don't have the Holy Ghost yet. They don't know the hearts of men yet. They will know them with the Holy Ghost on them because they'll be able to remit sins. Right now, the Holy Ghost has not come yet. They don't know the hearts of men, so they have to ask God, who do you choose to be that twelfth apostle? Verse 25, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. His own place uh, for Judas was, you know, of course... Well, the, I should say the reference to that he might go to his own place, meaning going to take that bishopric that Judas Iscariot had. So this would be the apostle would go to that place, that 12th throne, to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. So uh, to, to judge the 12th tribe there. So uh, that's the place referring to the, the apostle here chosen to take that throne in the kingdom. <clears throat> Verse 26, and they gave forth their lots. So that's where people say, oh, you see here, they're in the flesh. They're throwing dice to figure out who the apostle is. That's just nothing more than glorified gambling. It's like, why don't you just flip a coin to figure out who the twelfth apostle is? Yeah, and that's what people say to try to figure out Paul. But the fact is, Paul did meet the criteria. They're operating under Jesus' command, the Holy Ghost instructions in the Psalms, and they're praying to the Lord to give the, give the choice. And the casting of lots is how the Lord would choose. That's how he did it in the Old Testament under the law. And we are still in Acts chapter 1 under the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant. So let's look at a couple of passages. Um, let's say, let's look at uh, Leviticus 16 uh, and uh, 1 Samuel 14. Just for sake of time, we'll just look at those two. Uh, Leviticus 16 verse 8 and uh, 1 Samuel 14. Get these myself here. So in Leviticus 16 and verse 8, it says, And Aaron, so he was the high priest, it says, And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord, and the other lot for the scapegoat. That's something that God appointed, that they would cast lots to determine who's going to be the goat that would be killed on the Day of Atonement. And who is the goat that will be the scapegoat? God would give them that determination. God would tell them, this one's the scapegoat. This one's the one who's going to be sacrificed uh, on the day of Yom Kippur here for the sins of the people. God is the one choosing that, and he does so through the casting of lots. He gives his choice. He tells them the choice through the lots. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 41. Therefore Saul said unto the Lord God of Israel, so he said to God of Israel, Give a perfect lot. And Saul and Jonathan were taken, but the people escaped. And Saul said, Cast lots between me and Jonathan, my son. And Jonathan was taken. Basically, it's a, really to find out who had sinned at this point. Uh, and so at first, it's narrowed down to either Saul or Jonathan. And then it's Jonathan. But you see here that it's the casting of lots. It's a choice between two. And the way God showed which of the two he had chosen, or in this case, who had sinned, was by the casting of lots. And so when the apostles here do this in Acts 1 verse 26, this isn't glorified gambling, this isn't flipping a coin, this is God's ordained way under the law. God said, this is what you do. He said, he told Aaron back in Leviticus 16, we read that verse, he says, Aaron shall cast lots. That was God's words. This wasn't something that they just made up to have a little fun, to have a little dice game while they're killing, having to go through the horror of killing a goat. This was something that God said, this is how I'm going to choose which goat lives, which one dies. And in this case, it's the casting of lots then is God's ordained way of choosing which one is going to take that 12th throne. And so there in verse 26 of Acts chapter 1, they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. So now we've got the 12. 
That was the last step that needed to be taken before the Holy Ghost comes. Now we get into Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, notice it says fully come. The day of Pentecost, we read in Exodus chapter 34, is something that happened every single year. The Feast of Weeks, the first fruits of harvest. Every year they had the, that wheat harvest that they, they took up and they celebrated the first fruits going in and getting the harvest. They've celebrated Pentecost every year for the last 1,500 years. But now, well, they, they were supposed to have done it, I should say. They went into apostasy and didn't do it for a long time. Uh, but that was something God had ordained. But it says here, it's not just when the day of Pentecost was come. It says when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Meaning, this particular day is the full fulfillment of the day of Pentecost. God ordained seven feasts. And each of them point to, they're a type of a greater thing that would happen. When Jesus came, he fulfilled the, uh, the fall feast, I believe it is, and he'll fulfill the spring one, ones at his second coming, or it could be vice versa, I may have gotten that mixed up. But the point is, he fulfilled the, the uh, it must have been the spring, he must have filled the spring feast because the, the harvest. So, or maybe, uh, anyway, wh whatever it is, <laughs> You figure it out. <laughs> but uh, Jesus came and he fulfilled the Passover. He was the full fulfillment of the Passover by being that sacrificial lamb. And so too, the Holy Ghost coming, that's the full fulfillment. They've celebrated harvest every year. But this is the first time that they're going to be celebrating the first fruits of spiritual harvest. So the spiritual fulfillment of a feast is the full fulfillment of it. And so that's why it says they were, it was fully come. It says they were all with one accord in one place. So they were united as God had told them to do. Um, be united in him that they may be one as, as God, as Jesus and God the Father are one. Um, and so then in verse 2 it says, Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. This should remind us of Exodus chapter 40. In the last few chapters of the book of Exodus, God gives detailed instructions to Moses and to Israel of how to build the tabernacle. When it's finally built, it's a holy, perfect tabernacle because they follow those detailed instructions under the power of the Holy Ghost. And in Exodus chapter 40, verse 34, after the tent is finally completed, it says there, Exodus 40, 34, then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation, because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So God's presence comes into Israel here with the tabernacle and the tabernacle, and he stays with them until you get over to Ezekiel chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, because they went into apostasy. God's glory left, and he left Israel. Well, then he came back in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, and now, just like that temple was filled before, now the temple is filled again, except it's not the Jewish religious temple in Jerusalem, because that's still apostate. That's under the Sadducees, the Pharisees. You saw they killed Christ. They're certainly not holy. And so it's, re it's really uh, the new temple, at least at this point here, would be this upper room here. That's where and it fills it fills all the house where they were sitting. And you can see the fact that they're all with one accord and one a play in one place. That shows you the holiness of it. They weren't in the flesh. They weren't doing their own thing. But it was a holy place so the Holy Ghost could come in and fill it. And so now, just like back in Exodus chapter 40, God has filled Israel. He's filled saved Israel, the little flock, the 120. That's all that's left. And, and it's sad that there are only 120 when you consider Jesus had fed 5,000 men plus women and children, and now you've got 120, including the women, left. So out of all those thousands of people that followed Jesus during his earthly ministry, now that he's uh, been crucified and risen from the dead, only 120 are found out to be true believers. Uh, but that's, that's where... Israel now is in that upper room. It's the 120, the little flock there. Uh, verse 3 now, Acts 2, verse 3. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each one of them. 
of the time, the fire there really is a reference. If we uh, hold your place and go over to Matthew 3, and then a few uh, pages before that, Malachi 3, the last book of your Old Testament. Malachi 3, Malachi 3, verse 2. But who may abide the day of his coming? You know, the second coming there. And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. So this is speaking of that tribulation period, those seven years. They're going through the fiery trials of the tribulation period so that the Lord can refine out those who are impure, those who are not believing the gospel, those who are not following God's law covenant, they're not going to enter into the kingdom. But those who do follow that covenant, even through the persecutions of the tribulation period, they are the true believers. They're going to make it into God's kingdom. John the Baptist had warned in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So this, isn't, this doesn't mean they're going to get fire with the Holy Ghost. The fire is the judgment that they get for not believing because verse 12 explains that. It says, Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. Though that's the ones who are filled with the Holy Ghost. But will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That's the... That's the uh, lake of fire, being cast into the lake of fire. So, really, when we're over in Acts chapter 2 and verse 3, where it says, Clo Cloven tongues, like as a fire, sit upon each one of them, it's a sign of the fiery trials that they will go through in the tribulation period. And it's a warning to unbelieving Israel, who will see that fire as they, as they speak with those other tongues, that this is what you'll get. You'll get the fire if you don't believe the gospel that is preached. You'll be cast into the lake of fire, as John the Baptist said there in Matthew 3, verse 12. So it's not both. It's not. It's an either-or type thing. You're baptized with the Holy Ghost. You go through a fiery trial, but you come through the other end unscathed, just like the three Hebrew boys in Daniel chapter 3, I believe it is. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego through, going through the fire. Not even a hair was singed. So that's what it's referring to here. The fire then would be that the fiery trials and then culminating being cast into the lake of fire if you don't survive those trials. Verse 4 now, Acts 2 verse 4, They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. The reason is what we read over in... Uh, Maybe I get another scripture that makes it a little more clear. Um, uh, Deuteronomy 16. Go over to Deuteronomy 16. The reason you have... Well, let's read Deuteronomy 16, then I'll go back to explaining what we've got here. Under the law, God had said... We talked about the feast that God had said. Well, God says here in Deuteronomy 16, verse 16, that there are three feasts every year that a Jewish male must go to Jerusalem to the temple and appear before the Lord. Deuteronomy 16, verse 16, it says, Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose. That's Jerusalem. In the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and in the Feast of Weeks, and in the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. Pentecost is the Feast of Weeks. So if you are a good Jew, or as Acts 2, verse 5 says, they were devout men. If you're obeying God's law and you're a man, then you will go to the temple at this time. So they are headed to the temple. It says that though, though in Acts 2 verse 5, it says the Jews were out of every nation under heaven. That's because of the fifth cycle of chastisement, Leviticus 26 verse 33. Because Israel had disobeyed the law of covenant, God had said in that verse that he will scatter them among the heathen. So the Jews aren't one nation in Israel in the promised land, but they are all scattered among all these nations. And the good, devout Jews obeying the law, even though they're in some foreign nation in Gentile territory, they go to the temple, according to God's command, Deuteronomy 16, verse 16, to observe the Feast of Weeks. And so that's why they're scattered among these nations, And but these are the devout men. So these are the cream of the crop, basically. They're not the little flock at this time in the sense that 
they haven't believed the gospel of the kingdom, repent and be baptized, but they are trying to obey God's law covenant. Uh, they're having faith in what God has told them, which is to appear before the Lord on this feast. And so that's why they're there. They're devout and they're from every nation. Verse 6 now says, Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Alamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So notice there in verse 7 that the, the little flock, they're Galileans. Jesus had said back in Matthew chapter 4, if we'll go over there, when he began his ministry, most of his ministry was in Galilee because the people who were the big religious people of, of Israel, they were in apostasy. They were following not God's law, but following the tradition of the fathers. They were harder to reach than people who just weren't following that. And so the ministry was in Galilee, uh, Matthew 4 verse 12 says, Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. Uh, verse 14, That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zabulon and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. So this is still the land of Zebulon and uh, Na Naphtali. Those are two tribes of Israel. But they are so far removed from the Jewish religious system that people consider them to be, the Jews consider them to be just like Gentiles, a Gentile territory. But that's where Jesus ends up ministering. And so the little flock then, when we get to Acts chapter 2, they're Galileans. They're from those tribes. So that's the first thing to note is they're Galileans. They would only know the Galilean tongue, but yet the people here in all their tongues, and there we read that long list of nations there. Now, a couple things to note here. As it says there in Acts 2, verse 8, that they hear every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. And so what I think is going on here is they spoke... They probably all spoke the same words at the same time uh, in one language that the Holy Ghost gave them. The Holy Ghost had them speak these words all in unison, sort of like a choir, and all speaking these words. And then each man, though, it was, it was not different tongues that they spoke, but that, they, that it was the understanding. The Holy Ghost had them understand in those different tongues. And the reason I say that is because the fact that you could just think that if you have 15 different uh, nations here, if you had 15 different languages being spoke all at the same time, uh, it would be utter confusion. Uh, just thinking, even if you had English, if you have 15 people speaking English, but they're different words, um, you're not going to be able to understand what anybody says because there's 14 other people you got to filter out. Uh, perhaps they did speak if they did speak in other tongues, well, then that was the Holy Ghost. Um, you know, if they did speak in 15 different languages, then that was the Holy Ghost allowing each one to filter out uh, the other 14, and they only heard their language. That's a possibility, but I tend to think that it was the Holy Ghost really interpreting for them so that they spoke this language that the Holy Ghost gave them, but that these people who were listening heard it in their own language. So the, the listener, what they translated it into... Uh, was different. What's going on here is a reversal of Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel. If you remember in Genesis chapter 11, verse 1, it says the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. What ends up happening is that since everybody spoke the same language, they all united in their rebellion against God, such that God says there in verse 6, Genesis 11, verse 6, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they began to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. 
go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So, they were all united in rebellion against God, so God puts a stop to it by giving them all different languages. That's where the different languages come up. So in Acts chapter 2 is a reversal of what happens in the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. And God only does it so it's done for his purposes. So it's not that everybody now speaks this one language and now everybody can understand each other and they can do whatever they want. But it's rather only through the power of the Holy Ghost can they speak these other languages and understand them in their own language. And so it's showing that it's only a language for God's people so that the people will be united not in rebellion against God, but be united for God so that they can reach, they don't have to take, you know, five years uh, to learn a certain language or then another five years to learn another one. But they can go to all the lost sheep of the house of Israel scattered abroad wherever they are, go to all of Israel there and not having to learn the language, but the Holy Ghost will speak through them. That's what this is. Uh, so that's what's going on here, is that they speak the gospel to them uh, through the Holy Ghost here, uh, so that they understand it in their own tongue, even though they don't know that language. And notice also that the speaking in tongues here is the complete opposite of what you find today in Pentecostalism. With Pentecostalism, you have a church that gets together, and they all speak a common language, and then they start speaking, and when they speak in another tongue, they speak in a language that none of them understands. The opposite is happening here. Here you have people united, and they speak, uh, and they speak uh, these in other tongues here, and you have the whole group here, and they don't all just know one language. Here they know at least 15 different languages among the people in the audience. But now, those 15 languages are understood as if it's one language. So, today, Pentecostalism goes from one language and goes down and speaks a language that no one can understand. Here, it's everybody speaks a different language. They can't understand each other, but the Holy Ghost speaks, and now, through the other tongues, everybody can understand the message. So, it shows what's going on today is a complete opposite of, the speaking in, of what was going on with the speaking in tongues. And the purpose of this here was so that the Jews, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, may be saved. They may hear the gospel, they may hear those wonderful works that God did, and that they may be saved. You don't have that in the church today. Today, it's just utter confusion, and it's a mockery of God. People don't won't want to, unsaved people won't want to go to a church where there is just a bunch of jibber-jabber that they can't understand. Uh, continuing on here, now verse 12, Acts 2, verse 12, they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Uh, others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. So you have there uh, the two groups here. One group that uh, of the devout Jews who are saying, well, you know, what's going on here? What does this mean? And then you have the other group, people who are just mocking, who are not believers, who aren't devout men, uh, just saying, well, they're full, full of new wine. Obviously, that's not the case. Uh, it's early in the morning. They don't act drunk, and uh, they don't have any wine there. There's no evidence of it. They're just mocking now verse 14, now Peter is going to say, give an answer to that, to what meaneth this. Notice Peter is not preaching a message to the church today. It's not to the Gentiles, not to the body of Christ. He preaches to Israel, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Notice in verse 14, he says, ye men of Judea. That's about halfway down the verse there. He says, ye men of Judea. Look at verse 22. It starts off, ye men of Israel. Then look in verse 36, it says, Therefore let all the house of Israel. He's not speaking to Gentiles, he's speaking to Israel. Now he's speaking to Jews, as verse 5 says, he's speaking to Jews from other nations. So they came in uh, from these other nations. Uh, in fact, verse 10, the last word of verse 10 says that some of them were proselytes, Jews and proselytes. Proselytes would have been Gentiles who became Jews by giving themselves under the law, being circumcised, uh, agreeing to obey God's law covenant and that he made with Israel. So they are Jews in that sense because they become Jews. So he is only speaking to Jews. The audience is Israel because Israel must be saved first and then they go out and spread the gospel of the kingdom to the Gentiles. So this is Israel's kingdom program, Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6. God says 
to Israel, you're going to be a holy nation, a kingdom of priests. You're going to reconcile the earth back to me for all the earth is mine. And so that's what he's doing. He's building up that kingdom of priests. We've only got 120 right now, and it's going to build from here. So Peter says there in verse 14, Peter standing up with the eleven, lift up his voice and said unto them, so notice the two groups again, Peter standing up with the eleven, Peter being the leader, and then the other group there, the eleven uh, remaining apostles, including Matthias, because he is, we've got a full twelve there. And they're standing in that leadership position with Peter being over them, just like they're going to be on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel in the kingdom. So Peter, standing up with the eleven, lift up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, it's Israel he's talking to, nobody else. Be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, uh, which would be about 9 a.m. <clears throat> Verse 16. They ask, What meaneth this? He says, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he goes, and in the next few verses there, he quotes uh, Joel, uh, Joel 2, verses 28 through 32. Uh, we won't go there just because you've got the text right here. That's Joel 2, 28 through 32. So here in Acts 2, verse 17, quoting the prophet Joel, he says, And it shall come to pass in the last days. In other words, that... Israel has entered the last days, which will end in, in verse 20, it says, the last part there, it says, that great and notable day of the Lord come. That's Jesus' second coming. So when he's talking about the last days, he's talking about that last, you know, the, the tribute. Now, they haven't technically entered the tribulation period yet. They're in that one-year grace period that we talked about in Luke 13, verses 6 through 9. Then, after that one year is over, if they believe the gospel, then they'll enter the tribulation period. And then the great and notable day of the Lord will come. So they are in the last days. This is not a reference to us today. Now, we do have last days in the gospel of grace, but the last days of Israel's prayer, we are not in these last days. These are last days that are specifically for the nation of Israel, for the kingdom program. Daniel 9, we read it earlier, there are 70 weeks or 490 years left. Well, when you've got 483 of the 490 gone, you, know, you can say you're in the last days. You know, seven out of four ninety. Those are the last days. You don't have many left. That's where they are, prophetically speaking, in Israel's program. It has nothing to do with the body of Christ, the dispensation of grace. That's later. They don't even know about that at this time. That's a mystery. This is Israel's program, prophecy. So it says there, verse seventeen, it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. In the Old Testament, we see the Holy Ghost, the Spirit being poured out in several cases, but it's always a very limited thing. It's He poured it out upon uh, those building the tabernacle. Moses had the judges, um, you had uh, the kings, Saul, David, and certain other kings, uh, certain other people, Samuel, there are very few people, it's just a very few, you know, here or there, maybe one person at a time, and, you know, in, in all of Israel, maybe only one person has the Holy Ghost, uh, if that, maybe just a, maybe 70, or, you know, not that many at all have the Holy Ghost, but in the last days, God had promised not just one or two, or just a select, but all those who believe the gospel of the kingdom, they're going to have the Holy, the Holy Ghost. This is something new. That's why he, he makes that reference. That's why he, he says, on that, I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh, meaning all of Israel, not the Gentiles. He's talking to Israel here. It's, it's to all flesh. It says, you know, basically, your sons and daughters, your young and old, your servants, your masters, everybody, all those who believe the gospel of the king, not just the king, not just the judge, everybody who believes the gospel of the kingdom and joins the little flock, they're going to have the Holy Ghost. So that's what's different here. We're still in Israel's program. It was prophesied by Joel, Joel chapter 2. But it's just a different phase of God's program where he's going to pour out the Holy Spirit because, frankly, they'll need him. They'll need to be filled with the Holy Ghost and able to endure the tribulation period. How are they going to stand before the judge? We're going to see that next week in Acts chapter 4. Peter, 
he denied the Lord three times when he wasn't even when Peter wasn't even on trial. He denied it to this young damsel who was holding at the door. He couldn't he couldn't even say that yes, Jesus is is my Lord and Master. He's the Messiah. He couldn't even say that to a little girl's door. But but they're going to be appearing before kings and rulers and the Sanhedrin and the religious leaders, and they're going to be asked to deny the Lord or lose their lives. If they don't have the Holy Ghost, if they're not filled with Him, they won't be able to stand up to that. So that's why the Holy Ghost is needed here. It's just that last part of Israel's program, the last days, the greatest time of Jacob's trouble, the refiner's fire, those fiery trials. So the Holy Ghost is coming upon them. That's the first thing. The last part of verse 18 says, They shall prophesy. Prophesy means they speak forth. They speak forth for God. They preach the gospel of the kingdom. And they speak of the things of the kingdom that are needed in order for the lost sheep to be saved. That's the ministry there of the last days, the tribulation period. Also in the tribulation period, verse 19, I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. So God is going to give positive signs through the casting out of devils, healing the sick, all those things that we saw in Mark chapter 16 and things that he did in his earthly ministry. He will be doing that through the disciples. Those are the positive signs for them to believe the gospel of the kingdom. Then verses 19 and 20 talk about the negative signs that they will see. And notice they're all related to blood and fire and you know, that darkness. Those signs there. Well, the, the uh, blood, would, of course, the life is in the blood. Uh, Leviticus 17 verse 11 says, you know, the, the, the blood, the life is in the blood. So that blood represents life. The fire represents the lake of fire. And so the idea here, and we're going to see it when we get to the book of Revelation, is that those signs are going to be showing that when the blood and the fire, it's showing that basically life is going to be thrown into the lake of fire if you don't believe this gospel. So the signs are, the good signs, casting out devils, healing the sick, doing those things so you may believe the gospel. And then the warning is, if you don't believe, this is what's going to happen to you. And we will look over, let's go over to, uh, hold your place and go over to Revelation 6 and also Revelation 8. And we'll just look at a couple of these things. The blood and the fire, that's a reference to what we see over here in Revelation in the tribulation period. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. So there you see the, the blood there. Uh, if you jump down to Revelation chapter 8 now, in verse 7. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. So there's the fire and the blood. And they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. So a symbol of that fire is going to come, and if you don't believe the gospel, you're going to be destroyed. You know, a third part of them died, that's what's going to happen to you if you don't believe the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, verse 10, the third angel sounded, there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And uh, verse 12, Now the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. So these just aren't just neat little tricks that God does. Well, doing it with creation shows that it is God doing it. It's not something man can do. I mean, man can't, man can't even look at the sun, uh, you know, without having permanent eye damage and so man certainly couldn't do anything about uh you know as far as making the sun dark or turning in the, or the moon into blood and so these are all signs that god does it shows that god is doing it but it's also showing that god, this is what god will do in that uh in that tribulation period as a sign of if you don't believe the gospel of the kingdom well then you're not going to be you're not going to be saved. You're not going to be part of the kingdom. You're going to be just like that fire. You're going to be cast in the lake of fire. Your blood, your life is going to be cast in the lake of fire. So that's what is going on here. The last days, the positive side, the gospel with those signs, and the negative side, uh, what's going to happen if you don't believe the gospel. 
Continuing out in Acts chapter 2, verse 21, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you do believe that gospel of the kingdom, you won't have to worry about having cast into the lake of fire and spending eternity there. Uh, but you will be saved and into God's kingdom. Verse 22 now, now that you've seen what this is, this is the, a sign of the last days, what's happening, where God pours his spirit out. Now we get the preaching of Jesus. The 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 gospel of the kingdom is not what it is today. Today the gospel, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4 says, to uh, believe in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sins. That's not what the gospel of the kingdom is. The gospel of the kingdom is repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Change your mind, abandon the tradition of the fathers, go back to God's law covenant, and then be water baptized so that you'll be cleansed from your idolatry. That's the gospel of the kingdom. He's going to preach Jesus here, but Jesus isn't preached as good news. You'll notice he is going to be preached as bad news. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, Notice what they didn't, they didn't say. It doesn't say, He died for your sins. Trust in Him so you'll be saved. But it says, Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. So the great and notable day of the Lord is coming where God's going to judge man. And it says, Man is guilty of crucifying their Messiah here. Uh, verse 24, Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. That's the justice of God would not allow a just man, the Lord Jesus Christ, to stay in hell in the lake of fire. So he had to bring him out, out of there. Verse 25, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Uh, this, this passage here, verses 25 through 28, is a quote of Psalm 16, 8 through 11. And it really shows you that it isn't David uh, speaking of himself, but it's the Lord Jesus Christ is prophetic of his death. Uh, there's a lot of good detail, but we just don't have time to go into. So David spoke that the Lord is always before my face, meaning uh, the Lord is always before Jesus Christ's face, face. He is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope resting in hope of the resurrection, the confident expectation that I will be resurrected from hell after I've died on the cross, that I may be raised, uh, knowing that uh, God's justice will prevail. Because, verse 27, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. So he's basically showing, showing the Israel that, David had prophesied, the Old Testament prophesied of the fact that the Messiah would be crucified and he would be risen from the dead. So this isn't just something new that they're just sort of playing around it, that Jesus really just came as a king, but it, his plan got sidetracked, so now they're just making stuff up. No, this is all prophetic. This is something that the, the Old Testament said, and these are devout men that he's preaching to, devout Jews. Verse 5 tells you that. And so he's preaching to these devout Jews. They should know the scripture, and then they should relate to, yeah, this is what's happened. Uh, so it's, you know, the, Jesus is our Messiah. Verse 29, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. So in other words, David didn't speak this of himself. He spoke it of the Messiah, because David was not raised from the dead, and, but rather it was the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 30, Now therefore being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. That's the Davidic covenant. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14. God says to David that I will establish your throne forever, and your son will rule with you forever. And so since God had promised that, then that's how, and in fact that's how David you know, David would say this stuff in the first person, Psalm 16, 8 through 11. This scripture that Peter is quoting is all in the first person. 
but in the way it can be true, but it's really referring to the Messiah. And the way it's true of David is because the promise was made to David that he would be on the throne forever, and he would do so through the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, sitting on the throne forever. And so by implication, since the promise is to David and to the Lord, then if the Lord is going through the suffering and he's in hell and he has to be raised from the dead, David too is raised from the dead and that his promise is raised. So you see it's in the first person relating to David in Psalm 16. It really is referring to the Lord, but it's not a lie in that it still relates to David because the promise of the Davidic covenant sitting on the throne forever is for David and his son, for the Lord Jesus Christ. So both apply to him, even the Lord Jesus Christ was the one who suffered and rose from the dead. It also applies to David. Uh, verse 31, Now he seen this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. So what meaneth this was their question back in verse 12. What meaneth this is that you're in the last days, the Holy Ghost has come as a result of the Messiah coming, dying for the sins of Israel, and being raised to the right hand of the Father. And it says there in verse 34, For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord saith and said unto my Lord, Sit thou on thy right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So it shows here that they are in a lot of trouble. If you, uh, We're just going to take a quick break as we change tapes, and then we'll come back and I'll explain to you, leaving in suspense here for just about a minute, as to why they are in...